Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, uh, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you another really cool guest involved in creating a better tomorrow uh, for millions of people out there. Uh, a really cool story today uh, on the entrepreneurial front. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Rocky Batesell, uh, who is the chief executive officer of a company called Snapslide. Um, they recently introduced to the market uh, the first child resistance closure uh, that has a single-handed opening for both prescription and OTC medication bottles. Uh, and this really interesting patented solution, of which Mitchell Basel is the inventor, uh, is ultimately focused on bringing uh, life-changing potential for close to 60 million Americans alone uh, that have physical limitations, ultimately addressing this uh, vital yet you know pretty much overlooked aspect of, of sort of the inclusivity theme, uh, namely medical education accessibility. Uh, Mr. Batesell, he uh, did his uh, bachelor's degree in biology at Mary University in Pennsylvania, and then ultimately was enrolled in medical school and happened to notice that uh, his grandmother was uh, struggling with traditional uh, push and twist uh, child resistant caps. And uh, it was that inspirational moment that led his uh, career to pivot a little bit into this world of entrepreneurship leading out on this very first prototype, which would become Snapslide. Uh, and after they secured patent protection, uh, he also form, form the company around the innovation and is dedicated to advancing not just the engineering, but diversifying the applications and ultimately leading Snapslide's mission to bring this really adaptive solution to everyone that needs it. Um, honored to have him with us. Really interesting story. Looking to get into uh, Rocky Batesell. Uh, thanks so much for coming, coming on the show. Hey, Ira. Thanks for having me, man. Great, great, great intro. Yeah, great no, intro. I don't even, <laughs> you know, the nail on the head on everything. I don't even know why I'm here now. No, no, we, we, we have a lot to talk <laughs> about. Uh, we we, we definitely have a lot to talk about. Uh, you know, before we get into everything, uh, snap slide, before we even talk about your grandmother, um, take a couple minutes just to talk about you. I mean, uh, you you, uh, you clearly were on the path. You were interested in biology, obviously looking at medicine. Um, tell, tell us a little about, about yourself and uh, a little bit more about your background. Uh, I think grow, grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. Um, take us into the early days. Scranton, Scranton, PA, the home of the office. For those yeah. of you who don't know, yeah. uh, Northeast PA is Scranton. But that's our that's our claim to fame here, here in Scranton, is uh, the office. So I was just a regular guy, um, big fan of science, always like researching, um, experimenting, doing stuff like that. And throughout school, uh, I was a late bloomer, if you will. I didn't decide I wanted to hit up medical school until like a couple of years into college. I was undecided as most kids are, you know, who, who wants, nobody knows what they're doing right out of high school, you know? So just started, I uh, was doing, doing things, trying to find my way and uh, got into the sciences and uh, started to pursue medicine. And that was where my passion was and got into medical school. About a year in, I don't know what it was. Something was driving me in another direction. Um, my heart wasn't in in it. And it was a tough decision, man, to leave med school. You know, you're invested and you're in there and you know the you know the path, you know, graduate med school, do a residency, get out and start to uh help people in medicine and make a career. So, you know, that path. So it was a tough one to jump out into the unknown. So that's, I had a lot of support from family, from friends. A lot of people thought I was crazy. You know, what are you doing? You leave a medical school? You got a path laid out here. Just do it. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to. One thing, I don't, I don't like regrets. You know, I, if I 
feeling it, my gut's telling me to do something. I like to do it because later down the road, you know, I don't want to look back and be like, oh, I should have done that. I'm not happy now. So take that leap when you're feeling it and uh, things work. Things tend to work out. A lot of work, but yeah. so left medical school and just started doing some things. I wrote a book on medical school, played around on a couple ideas, uh, cold calling companies, you know, on little things I came up with, just trying to find my way, you know, learning the ropes. And, uh, and then my grandma, my mother came to me and uh, opened my eyes to this unmet uh, need for over 70 million Americans who uh, have trouble accessing their medication. You know, it's it's interesting because, you know, as we were chatting before the show, you know, I, I you know told you I'm a, a sort of people that watch the show know I, I started my career out as a, as a pharmacist down the road here from you in, in Philly. Um, and yeah, it was sort of, you know, familiar sort of more with this problem or the, sort of the other side of the equation. And it's how sort of this problem was always sold to us as pharmacists that, hey, we got to keep young kids out of the prescription bottles. And that was sort of <laughs> the extent of the science that existed. Talk about, um, you know, what you ran into specifically with your grandmother in, in the sense that, and we'll get into sort of the big numbers of sort of the, the 70 million that you were mentioning in a little bit, but what specifically did you uh, see per your grandmother um, and, and sort of her issues? Um, and just, you know, it's, it's something we don't think about as a, you even said it unmet, but um we take a lot of medication in this country. Uh, a lot of it is in, in, with elderly patients. Uh, what, what, what's the story with your grandmother and sort of the aha moment that uh, you first said, okay, now I know what I want to do. So my, my mother came to me and I remember it like it was yesterday. I uh, was at my apartment and my mom came in and we were close to where my grandmother lives. And she's like, rock. She was a little bit frustrated because she been going over my grandmother's all the time to open up pill bottles for her, I guess. She's like, Rock, you want to think of something? Think of something for these damn pill bottles. Graham can't get into them. You know, I have to go over, and I go over about two or three times a week, and I have to open them all for her. And then she just leaves the cap on them, so she could just take the cap off and pull them out, you know. And what happens? She knocks them all over. Pills go in the sink. The, caps, the cap flies all over the place. You know, and then where the grandkids come over, she gets paranoid, she puts them back on, and the whole process starts all over again. And my mom was like, she's driving me crazy with these. And I thought that was interesting. I'm like, wow. It was not something I even thought of. It was just, you know, we all use child-resistant closures every day, whether it's uh, prescription medication or you're taking your Tylenol. You know, everything's in yep. for child-resistant closure. And I thought about it. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. I, I don't like it. I'm an able-bodied guy. And... I don't really care for taking it. They're a pain. They're a pain for me. Can't imagine Graham, who's in her early nineties at this point, that limited strength and dexterity. Boy, that's got to be tough. So I started researching and I discovered that it hasn't changed in over fifty years. Some iteration of a torque-dependent motion. Now, child resistance huge critical element that's needed, and. It needs to be a two-part mechanism, you know, a simultaneous open process. Push and turn, squeeze and turn. So I knew it needed to have two parts. I knew it needed to meet the CR criteria, but I wanted to just change up the mechanical operations, almost have it be more of a mental challenge than a physical challenge. You know, a, a mental challenge, physical challenge, you have to breach every single time. A mental challenge, you have to only breach once, and you have to. And uh, just started researching it, and I walked into a wine and spirits store, which is, you're a, you're a PA guy. Yep. You know, that's our local local liquor store. And I saw a lady there handing out sampling wines, and she happened to be an amputee. Now, imagine that I'm walking in, I'm I'm thinking, here I am thinking closures, child-resistant closures. Now, I don't know how many people go into wine and spirit stores thinking about this stuff. But I walked in there, and I saw this amputee. I was like, holy God, how how does she do it? You know, Graham at least has two two arms to do it. How, does she, how do amputees do it? And I, I watched her open a cork on a wine bottle, and it was cumbersome. It was a struggle for her. She had her technique down, but it was tough. 
And I said at that point, I'm like, okay, whatever I develop needs to be one heart, one hand accessible. Mm -hmm. okay. Less dexterity, less force needed for Graham with arthritis and limited strength, but also one hand accessible for those that are amputees. And that kind of allowed me to think outside the box a little bit and come up with entirely different different mechanics instead of torque, a linear sliding motion. And that's kind of where I popped in my head, maybe 11 o'clock at night. I'm just some of the best ideas just come out even in the shower or right before you go to sleep at night. It might be when your brain's the most relaxed and boom, just, just came to me. Mm -hmm. And then that's where the journey began. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, clearly this journey, um, goes, well, it, it, it goes through two major things. Um, we're, we're some very big numbers involved and I'd like to just highlight both of these for the audience and you can, you know, uh, talk about them independently. One, uh, is just the numbers involved here. And I mentioned, you know, we, we mentioned the sort of the beginning, that's sort of 70 million number in the United States alone. Uh, and only, you know, not, I shouldn't say only, but there's a very large number, as you were just saying, about just amputees, in, in, uh, upwards of 12 million either amputees, people with stroke, paralysis, birth defects. And then you pile on top of that. And again, we don't think of this, uh, you know, I guess, being young guys, but we, we have, um, you know, elder statesmen and women in our families. Um, fibromyalgia, arthritis, Parkinson's disease, MS. I mean, there's a lot of things connected here. And I'd just like you to talk a little, because this is not a small number by any means. And again, something we think about, you know, protecting the kids, a lot of kids, but there's a lot of people that require this. Talk a little bit about that number. It, it's very important that the audience understands. It's wild, it. it's wild uh, the demographic of people that struggle. And as I was getting down this path, I was talking to people, the random strangers coming up to them, asking them what their thoughts are with current prescription bottles. The general consensus was I, I hate them. I can't do it. I need somebody to do it for me. You know, it's cumbersome. I don't like doing it. Whatever their reasons were, whether they can or they struggle or they can't at all. And it was unanimous. Um, and I thought that was incredible. So I started really research on the demographics. And what we did, we broke it down into three demographics of people, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary being, you only have one arm, whether it's an amputee. There's about a million people out there with only have one arm due to an amputee. Um, hemiparesis after a stroke, about 9 million. Mm -hmm. Every time, uh, about 80% of stroke patients have some form of hemiparesis, which is paralysis on one side of the body. Now, they, they have an arm, but their arm isn't functional. Um, brachial plexus injuries, spinal cord injuries, brachial plexus, uh, brachial nerve, the major nerve that goes down your arm that allows your arm to move. If that's damaged, you practically have no arm or limited motion of it. So there's 12 million people that only have one arm to use. So that's our primary demographic, people that like need they're on medication and they need a way to easily access it and not depend on others. You know, I, it drives me crazy when adults, they, people don't want to depend on others. They want to have the same package, same thing as everybody else and be able to use it themselves. And mm -hmm. that's, that's my mission. Yeah. Um, and then there's the secondary demographic, which is you have both arms, but you have limited ability, you know, arthritis being the human one. About 60 million Americans have some form of arthritis, uh, MS, multiple sclerosis, you know, um, neuromuscular conditions, other things that you have two arms, but you just have weakness, dexterity, inability to move them. So it's not so much you need the one arm to access, but you just need something that requires less force and dexterity. Mm -hmm. And then you have the tertiary, which is everybody else. Right like you and I, that just want convenience. You know, the, don't have to worry about the cap fall. That was a big thing I got from people. You know, I dropped the cap, it goes under the couch or this place, I got to put the cap down. Those things So just convenience. So that's yeah. everybody else, the tertiary. So those are the three demographics, primary, secondary, tertiary, and kind of developed a slogan, uh, Life-changing for many, convenient for all. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that there's 12 million people that it's life changing for than access themselves. And you could say 60 million people if you include the arthritis. And then everybody else that it's convenient for. It's just better. You know, I, me, I'm able bodied, but I take all my, take my vitamins and any meds I have in the car because I'll forget about them at home. And then I'm like halfway to work and I'm like, oh, geez, I forgot to take that. You know, so I just started to keep everything in the car. And I just, I just use Snapslide and pop them right in my mouth and don't even have to take my hand off the steering wheel and do it. And every time I think, I'm like, oh, who invented this thing? This is pretty good. And I'm, <laughs> the, I'm the biggest critic of yeah. it. But so depending on what your wants are, what type of mobility you have, it's convenient or life changing depending on who you are. Yep. And, and, and let's, um, that, that segues perfectly into one other thing, and then we'll get into sort of the entrepreneurial journey and, and developing it and, and, and getting it out there. But um, there's another really big number here, and I think we need to talk about it. And that is, uh, and this is a 2018 number, so I'm sure this has gone up, but it was estimated back in 2018 um, that the cost of poor medication adherence, of just not taking our medications because we can't access them appropriately uh, and so forth is close to half a trillion, over half a trillion dollars in the United States and, and all the risks that that ultimately leads to in terms of severe health events, hospitalization and so forth. Uh, we don't normally think of that number, but that's damn big. And combine that with, um, you know, we use the word, you know, we, so we talk about sort of low hanging fruit uh, on on the show a lot, you know, you know, and, 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 you know, uh, should we, you know, should we be developing this million dollar gene therapy when we have these lower hanging fruit drugs and so forth and that, but here seems a really important low hanging fruit that if we could optimize it uh, per something like Snapslide, um, it's a lot of money to be saved the United States healthcare system alone. Um, Huge, say a couple words about that figure as well. I think it's important. Huge. Uh, a lot of people, what, one of the biggest things I get is, is independence and people not taking their medication because they don't want to depend on somebody else. You know, so if you're a caregiver, if you're, you depend on your wife, your husband, whoever isn't home, then you're not going to take your medication, you know, or you just don't want to ask people, you know, so it's very, very important that People have the ability to access these tasks of daily living, you mm -hmm. know, independently at the, on their own time, you know, and not be kind of not having something be cumbersome that shouldn't be, you know. And if we could address that in a very simple way, and I'm a I'm crazy about simplicity in today's day and age, everything is technology, complication, software you know, real fancy stuff that I wanted to stay in my entrepreneurial journey. I wanted to stay away from that because everybody in my generation is going into more techie, sophisticated AI stuff. Yep. I like simplicity, man. I like to stick to making something as simple as possible. Yep. And addressing the CR closure in a new mechanical operation, it's, I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's simple. Now, the development of it wasn't simple, you know, any invention when you come up with something it's you're writing the book on it so a lot of trial and error what works what doesn't work you know but i want to address this fundamental this foundational principle of just having people be able to access their medication whether it's a prescription drug or you have a migraine or you're had a couple too many cocktails the night before and you need your tylenol to take care of that headache that's just easier for you to access so yep. If I could make life easier for a group of people on a daily basis, then I've done my job in the simplest way possible. About um, what happened next? Because you know you're up in Scranton, you have this awesome idea. Uh, as I mentioned in the bio, you you, you had a you go out and get a decent patent attorney to to write this thing up, and then you patented it. Uh, but then you got to get it made. Um, take a little time to to walk us through what, what happened next. Cause I'd love to hear a little bit about the, you know, we, we, we always see the end point of the entrepreneur story and we got this great product, but obviously, you know, there's a lot of sweat and tears along the way. Um, what happened after that? And in, in between, you know, coming up with the idea to getting this uh, to the market. 
So the first thing, when I had the idea in my head, I knew what it looked like and how it operated, but nobody else did. And I was, to pay the bills at the time, I was uh, teaching uh, science at a local college. And one of my students was a, a good artist. He was able to draw. So for extra credit, I had her stay after class to see if I could explain this idea to her so she could get it on paper. So I could then take it to patent people, engineers, you know, afterwards. And she was struggling. She couldn't, and I thought it was, I was like, oh my God, it's so simple, but you push this thing down and you slide it out and it's like the pill bottle, but it's not. Um, so she was struggling. So I'm like, hi, oh, I gotta figure something out here. So I went on Amazon and I got this really low melt plastic, it's something like little pellets. I'm in my kitchen here with uh, boiling water to heat this stuff up in a hairdryer. Boiling this resin up so it becomes like a clay. So it's malleable. And I'm just forming this thing into what is now a snap slide. And I finally got it. And it had the, it had the tab and it actually even clicked. Now it looked like absolute crap. Let me tell you, it did not, it was not going to be a final product, but it got the point across at least. So I was able to show it to her and boom, the light bulb went on for her and she was able to sketch it out and draw it on paper. And when I had that, I was able to now go to patent agents, patent attorneys to discuss the patent stuff because I was a medical student, remember? So yeah. I didn't really, I didn't know much about patents. I didn't know much about engineering, prototyping, anything like that. So I needed to count on people who knew this realm. And... A lot of patent attorneys telling me it's, man, there's no way you can get a patent on it. It's way too simple. There's stuff out there already and you can't do it. And I'm like, well, do my research. I haven't seen anything on it, so why not? So I went through about two or three patent attorneys that told me the same thing, pretty discouraging. So I found one that actually was like, okay, I like the idea. I like what you're doing. Let's do a complete patent search internationally. And domestically to see if there's anything else like like it because there is you're dead in the water but i'll do this patent search for you and i was i was broke at the time so he he helped me out and sure enough there wasn't there wasn't anything and he started getting excited like now the same thing that made it unlikely that you would get a patent with simplicity is now the thing that's going to allow you to really build a significant patent estate around it because it is so simple so that started that journey, learned a lot of patent stuff. And to this point, we have eight patents issued throughout the, around the world and three more coming. It's been a constant, constant with the patents. There's always improvements, different applications that yep. you can imagine is growing that patent estate, you know, kind of territory on the patents around sliding CR closures. Now, once you get the patent in, now it's engineering time. Oh, Same yeah. thing with the patents. Engineers can't can't be developed, can't be manufactured, you know, can't be done. It's amazing that the, and this isn't just my story. It's just the entrepreneurial way, I right. guess. Yeah. You know, it's, you get a lot of people telling you, nope, 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 a lot of no's. So if you want to be an entrepreneur or an inventor entrepreneur, even worse, oh, yeah. ready to take, take a beating. You're ready to take those no's and you got to keep going. Mm. If there's no logic to the no's, there's not a good reason as the no's, then you have to find out yourself, you know, and prove it out. Okay, it can't be molded. I asked why, and there's not really a good reason that resonates with me. That I'm like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so I didn't get that good reason, so I had to find somebody to actually take the chance and, and mold it, and sure enough, it didn't. I had people telling me it could never click. The snap, snap sign was the critical component that I wanted because I realized that a lot of people don't engage torque closures that have threads. They don't engage the threads properly. So therefore, it negates the entire child resistance component. Or they don't want to go back through the child resistance, so they just leave a cap on like my grandma did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so now there's no, now there's no child resistance. So... I knew I wanted that snap, an auditory cue to know that it's closed. So that was one thing that a lot of 
pushback. You never get a snap. You know, polypropylene, which is the plastic that it's an FDA grade uh, recyclable plastic that's used to make most most packages, not just prescription bottles. Yep. And that's kind of a softer, softer material. The durometer, the hardness of the material isn't really high for polypropylene. So people were telling me that you can never get that spring, that snap sound, to have that sound that you want. And once again, I didn't understand why. You know, that potential energy is given off in a kinetic and it's got to release something. I'm like, I think there will be sound, even though it is softer. I get it that it's softer, but I think there will still be sound. Well, sure enough, there is. You know, so it's just proven, proven the naysayers wrong and continuing down the road. Yeah. Never give up. That's the key, Ira. Yeah. Yeah, it's... um it's yeah I, I i appreciate you again you putting that message out there because you know whether you're you know doing something like this and you know yeah i i, I said i've been there too and uh, yeah you get a lot of no's and you know, you have to walk through those um every one of them and say hey why not and you know sometimes it's just because they there's people someone's tired and they're just not interested in investigating yeah. how to do it and all that but you know I mean, you persevered which is awesome i mean that's the i, I think that's uh, aside from you know, coming up with this idea and creating the thing, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, and that's something I think too, too few nowadays uh, in sort of this online world of stuff that we're, you, know, you don't really touch a product, don't understand as much. So I, I think that's a very important message. I, I appreciate you know, you that. You know what I'm talking about. You're yeah, a pharmacist. Yeah. And yeah. You, you went off and now you're doing a podcast. How many people thought you were crazy? Yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of crazy things in between <laughs> so <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry, but that's, that's, a, that's for a different show. But um, yeah, let's, let's talk about, um, uh, let's talk about getting out there now because, you know, there's, and there's a couple of different baskets here, obviously that are very large, but if we just look at sort of the, the one where I started out, you know, um, here we are, it's 2024. There's something like close to 90,000 pharmacies alone in the United States when you include chains and independents and hospital pharmacy and specialty pharmacy. So, I mean, there's a huge, you know, existing, uh, and we'll talk about OTC in a minute, but that alone, can you just talk, you sort of introduce the audience to a little bit about sort of how these pharmacies currently uh, purchase these products and ultimately, you know, what it was like getting into these uh, distribution logistic chains, um, obviously in introducing something like this, which is novel, but at the same time, you know, um, I'm sure, and I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's not lots of <laughs> companies that distribute products like these to these pharmacies. So talk a little bit of that part of the story as well. So, you know, prescription bottles are not a B2C product. Consumers don't buy it. Businesses, the pharmacies. So that whole supply chain process, it's sophisticated, complex. Um, the volume, outrageous. About four, just in the U.S. alone, four billion prescription vials. There you go. With a B. So that's a lot. Um, low price point. Um, so high volume, low price point. So the scale that you need a, the production scale needs to be pretty uh pretty uh, pretty large to be able to crank out large volume at low cost now the invention itself needed to be simple which we achieved that a lot of development throughout to get the optimal forces you know for past child resistant testing which is a process in itself you know to achieve the right production and the logistical efficiencies to be able to produce it at that high volume. So a lot of development. So we accomplished the development earlier on in the year, and it was based on a lot of stealth mode. We weren't a lot of, nobody knew what we were doing. However, we were talking to pharmacies, big and small, distribution centers, big and small, uh, manufacturing centers, big and small. Every part of the supply chain, when you make a bottle, you know, it starts at the manufacturer. Then it goes to the pharmacy, if it's a big pharmacy, that have the volume. But most times it goes to wholesalers, distributors, that then sell it to the community pharmacies, the smaller pharmacies that may not have the monthly or quarterly volume to justify the manufacturer producing it for, for them directly. So you got to be able to hit in each one of those areas, whether 
manufacturing, distribution, pharmacy, right down to the consumer. They all have different wants and needs. You know, what's important for, to a distributor may not be important to the pharmacy. It's important to the pharmacist may not be important to the distributor. You know, but you got to be able to hit every one of those check boxes for each area. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and the only way to do that, you can't be in a bubble. So we went out and we talked to the largest players in the field on that to learn how it's done. And there was a lot of tweaking that we had to do, a lot of things that we didn't account for early on. I originally had a funny, the biggest thing it was a Q bottle. I don't know, actually, do. Our first prototype was actually cube shaped. Got it. The cube shape is great for packing, for efficiency. You get so many more cubes into a box than cylinders. Mm. You know, so the packing density is so much greater. Sure. I thought I was really onto something with the cube. But as we were going down the road, pharmacies and their label, we would have to change up the label nah. for the cube. You know, um, a lot of stuff on the filling side or in the OTC space, you know, would have to change. So we had to kind of sit back and say, okay, the cube is better, has its pros in a lot of areas, but there are cons with it. And that's just change. You know, the more things you have to change, the more resistant people are. So we had a, that was a big hit when we figured that the cube may not be the perfect first launch product. So back to the drawing board. So we had to take the technology and adapt it to a cylinder to keep it as close to how it is now as we can. So the way pharmacies get it, as you know, a pharmacy gets a bottle and, and caps come separately. So wanted to do it in that same process. Pharmacy gets a bottle that's cylindrical, label the same as they currently do, they fill it the same as they currently do, and they snap a cap on it, same as they currently do. Mm -hmm. So nothing changes from manufacturing distribution to the pharmacy side. The only thing that changes now is more improvement on the consumer side. Because that mm -hmm. cap you're snapping on now is more accessible. Snaps like rather than a push and shove cap. And the question now um, is about, uh, you know, because we were just talking primarily about the RX space. Um, clearly, the OTC space is gigantic um, and hundreds of billions of dollars of product. I don't know how many bottles they use of, you know, stuff like this. <laughs> um, what's the strategy there? Because clearly um, everything you were just talked about fits perfectly into that space as well. And take us into the OTC realm and sort of your thoughts, your strategies of of where you're headed there. Um, another, you know, major set of customers potentially for you. Yep. OTC, huge. Uh, three times the amount of volume. We're over 10 billion OTC bottles as opposed to 4 billion prescription bottles. Now, very similar, we wanted to adapt the closure to be as adaptable to RX and OTC. You know, they're very similar, but there are some differences. Uh, OTC, for example, they're, they're on the shelf. It's a point of purchase. You don't need a prescription to get them. So prescription vials, you go to the pharmacy, the pharmacy refills the prescription vial, you know, with the medication. You know, it comes in a big jug. If you're, as you know, you have a big jug of uh, medication and you give 30 tablets to Rose and you put those 30 tablets in her bottle with her label. You know, OTC, it's on the store shelf and it could sit there for months. So you need an induction seal, tamper evidence and induction seal to maximize that shelf life. So that's one thing that we're currently working on right now optimizing that induction seal for OTC as it applies to snap slide, in which RX, you don't need that. There's no induction seals. So that's one thing we're doing. Also the filling lines, making sure the cappers and everything with filling the high volume over the counter on their on their lines, the filling lines are optimized and good there, the most efficient process. So those are the two major Big differences between OTC and RX. 
the incorporation of inductive seal and making sure that the capping lines, which are all dependent on torque, a lot of them, are able to do a, a snap. The nice thing is that OTC, it's, I mean, like aspirin, for example. That's what's got me started thinking about OTC. Aspirin, one of the most widely used drugs on the planet. And, and anybody that had a stroke is probably on an aspirin regimen. Well, if 80% of stroke patients have some form of hemiparesis, but they need to take aspirin, how are they going to access that aspirin? They only have one arm to use. It's incredible. Same thing with a heart attack. It's the first thing you do, Ira. You have chest pain. You have angina going down your arm. What do you want to do? Take a baby aspirin. But now you have angina pectoris. Your arm is in pain. Immobile. How are you going to access that aspirin? So I, when it comes to aspirin, I feel aspirin needs to be one hand accessible. And that got me into, uh, all right, we got to adapt this and evolve staff slide for OTC medications. So that's right on the right on the coattails of rx so we we've been on uh rx we you've taken us to otc uh, and before the show i was you know looking around upstairs uh at all the other stuff that has some type of um child resistant cap on it and there's a lot of them <laughs> in this house alone from detergents to industrial well, industrial chemicals to to household chemicals to uh food products i, I mean there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity even beyond the medication space uh again rocky take us um a little into your thoughts i know these are probably aren't short term interest uh, of snap slide but you know down the road you know as, as the money starts to pour in um you're no doubt going to diversify into a lot of these areas so uh talk a little about some of your vision there 100 percent. and our mission isn't just to make medication ex more accessible it's to make any everything more accessible and the simplicity of snapslide allows you to adapt it relatively easily to different sizes and shape containers and different uses so definitely on our uh things to do list. We want to, uh, my, my mission at the end of the day is no matter what aisle you're going down at a grocery store, you know, there's snap slide on something, you know, there's maybe nothing as important as medication accessibility, but even your spice rack, you know, you're, you have your spatula in one hand and you have to spice up that, that salmon you're cooking, <laughs> boom, snap slide. Right. You know? So, right. Kind of a new element on the periodic table of closures you can think about that it's an atom just like uh oxygen or any like the the actual <laughs> elements you know right. when it comes to closures it's a new thing a new operation that you can now make molecules with it you know and those molecules are the different applications that it could apply to so anywhere from aspirin the rx all the way down to Household chemicals to kitty litter. But you see, I'm going to show you our uh, Flowgate application, which is going to be coming out in the near future. Um, it's a way to easily get those big jugs of kitty litter, you know, those boxes, yeah. right. 40 pound boxes. They're heavy as heck. To to use Snap Slide in a way that doesn't allow you to have to pick them up anymore. My buddy's in a wheelchair and he was struggling with that, so I made him a little Snap Slide adaption to his uh box of kitty litter is amazing how the flow that guillotine effect which chops off granular flow call it the flow gate line this is the cool way to apply snap slide to get kitty litter out who knew no 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 it's um yeah no i i um i enjoy listening to um again you know the these ideas come up and 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 where you're headed with all of this and uh it's an exciting story um and it's entrepreneurship it's it's technology and it's uh and not and i don't say anything about wrong about the low-hanging fruit but we you know we we sometimes think we have these solutions and you were pointing out this is 50 some odd years old since we've done anything in this space so um i'm, I'm excited for you i um i'm excited where all this is going and uh mm -hmm. What um what's what's coming up next for the company? Anything else that we should know about while we have you today in terms of uh, what we should be looking at uh, as twenty twenty five comes towards us? Production snap slides going out throughout the country. 
Excellent. these pharmacies, not just in uh, the U.S., but working things up in Canada. Right. It's funny. Everybody uses child-resistant closures. I've been just focused on the U.S., but as we launched early on in the year in, in May, we've been getting calls from all over the world. You know, it's funny. We just talk about those demographic numbers just on the U.S., but they apply everywhere. And everybody has the same pain points, you know, so figuring out how to align overseas with manufacturing and that, all that stuff, but getting it out to the U.S. first and across the world. All right. Well, uh, again, I, I wish you and um, your team uh, the best with all this, and uh, you know, I'm excited for you having started in this space and, and, and very familiar with what you're doing and i i know you're going to be quite successful at this and uh really you know wishing you the best for for the company for you uh as as you get these uh products out there um again for everybody that uh is going to be um listening to this episode of our show uh across the uh, various podcasts that it's going to be going out on or who will be watching on our youtube channel again you've been spending time with ricky Pitzel, chief executive officer of snap slide we'll put a link in the bio of the show doing really amazing things to bring this really life-changing uh, set of products to uh, tens of millions of Americans and uh, millions more around the world and addressing this issue of, uh, of medication accessibility that uh, is a very, very large number uh, in impact to the uh, healthcare system. But Rocky, I really want to thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while about what you're up to. Uh, Obviously, thank you for the millions of people out there for what you're doing. And as again, we like to say on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, via the development of, of a technology like this. Really a great story and wishing you the best with it. Appreciate it, Ira. That was, it was fun. I was happy to be here. We should yeah. do it again sometime. Definitely. We'll, we'll definitely do a follow-up. Awesome. Be well. Thanks a lot.